Hey, it's Shane from GotRom.com. In this video, you're gonna learn how to fix hip impingement without surgery. And in fact, these are the same strategies that I used to fix my own hip impingement back in 2011. You're also going to discover what I learned from spending over $25,000 on physical therapy and other treatment options. And you're gonna learn the lessons that I learned so that you can choose the best treatment option for you. So let's dive right in. So what is hip impingement? Well, the theory of hip impingement goes a little something like this. If you have bad bone shapes, that means you have femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. In fact, if you search Google for hip impingement, you'll probably find a definition such as a condition where the bones of your hip come too close together and pinch tissue or cause too much friction. Theoretically, bad bone shapes cause big hip problems, but this is not the whole story. For many years, doctors have claimed that FAI is exclusively a bone problem. If you have bad bone shapes, you will have FAI, is what they say. This is what I was told when I got an x-ray and MRI that showed that I had hip impingement, cam morphology, I had a paralabral cyst, and I had labral damage. But it turns out that there are two reasons for hip impingement, not just the bones. When the bones are a factor, there are three basic types of bony deformities. Cam impingement, pincher impingement, and mixed impingement. Cam impingement occurs when the head of the femur is too thick or has bumps and cannot fit well in the socket. Pincher impingement occurs when the rim of the socket or acetabulum has extra bone, which also causes the head of the femur to not fit well in the socket. Mixed impingement is when a person has a mix of these types of bone shapes. But what if you have bad bone shapes and no pain? Well, this is actually more common than you might expect. To rewind the tape a little bit, back in 2011, I had a lot of pain in my hip and in my back and a lot of movement problems. I was super stiff, but now I don't have any problems and I'm not super stiff. I'm actually quite flexible. So what gives? Basically, I learned how to optimize everything else, my tissue quality, my flexibility, my mobility, and my lifestyle. I still have bad bones, but even though my bones are poorly shaped, they are still, after all, ball and socket joints. Ball and socket joints can have incredible range of motion, even if they aren't perfectly smooth and spherical. So why doesn't everyone have incredible range of motion? The hips become limited because of tendons, ligaments, muscles, and yes, the shape of your bones. However, most people think that 90% of the problem is the bones. 90% of a person's mobility is because of whatever their genetics are, their bone structure. But this is false. If you have bad bones, the hips may still have the potential for incredible range of motion. But the key is you have to learn how to train properly. The summary is this. Research and experience shows that bone shapes are not the only reason hips hurt. They matter, but they're not the only determinant of hip joint health and mobility. You can read a lot more about this in an article that we wrote here. Now let's talk about the muscular reasons for hip impingement. It's possible to have problems in some or all of these categories, muscle flexibility or extensibility, muscle density, AKA do you have knots and trigger points in your muscles and motor control or how well you're moving. This animation explains the muscular theory of hip impingement. A healthy hip joint should be able to flex to about 125 degrees. The angle is measured from the extended position, like standing or lying down flat, as the knee is brought toward the chest. If the quads, adductors, and or hip flexors are tight, the femoral head could be pulled forward and in, causing the femoral head to hit the acetabulum prematurely. This would make it impossible to continue to flex the hip through the full range of motion. This will impede squatting, sitting, and being able to lift one's leg up and over objects. This situation is very common in athletes and in people who spend a great deal of time sitting. If the glutes and hamstrings are weak, this can create a similar situation. The lack of posterior muscular activity allows the femoral head to shift forward during hip motions. Compensatory tightness to stabilize the joint and relatively more strength in the quads, adductors, and hip flexors can pull the femoral head out of position. This is a common problem for people who tend to be very flexible. If the lateral hip rotators and or glutes are overly tight, the femur can be forced into lateral rotation during hip flexion. Extremely tight hamstrings will also very directly limit hip flexion and may also contribute to lateral rotation of the femur. By experimenting with different methods of massage, specific stretches, and using well-chosen exercises, you can uncover the layers of issues specific to any given person. Once balance, coordination, and strength are restored, full hip range of motion is also restored. 
The summary is this. Muscles that are too tight, too weak, or full of knots and trigger points can cause a joint to be out of position and cause impingement. In fact, the feeling of impingement is often just the muscles themselves and not the joint. And the fact that muscles matter shouldn't surprise anyone. If you don't stretch, strengthen, and massage your body, it's not gonna operate that well. It's not gonna work that well. It's just like a car that never visits the mechanic for a tune-up. It's not gonna drive very well. So how do you tell if you have hip impingement or if you've got something going on in your hip? Well, hip impingement can manifest in many ways, not just pain in the hip. Here are a few symptoms and tests that you can do to see if you have hip impingement. Afterwards, I'm gonna show you how to fix it. Note, these are not tests to tell if you have bad bone shapes. In fact, modern scientific research on FAI draws a distinction between FAI bone shapes and FAI syndrome. The studies show that you can have FAI syndrome, AKA pain or movement problems, and not have bad bones. So for the person watching this video or reading the accompanying article, if you fail one of these tests, don't think that you're doomed and everything's wrong. It just means that you have some kind of restriction or something going on in your hip. Don't be scared that you're doomed for life. There's plenty that you can do. Use these tests as a starting point for what you need to work on. So first, here are the symptoms that you may feel in daily life. Stiffness in the thigh, hip, or groin. The inability to flex the hip past 90 degrees. Pain during hip flexion and internal rotation pinching or aches in the front hip, groin, or outer hip. And the symptoms can manifest in various ways. The pinching can be sharp or dull, hard or soft. It can even be more like a constant throbbing in the hips or the groin and glute. And sometimes the symptoms show up not in the hip, but actually in the low back like they did for me in the SI joint. Sometimes you might even notice something off when you're in the gym lifting weights, squatting, or deadlifting. The symptoms can show up as early warning signs in the gym. And sometimes there's no pain at all. You just find, ah, I'm really tight in my hips. I'm really restricted. So in short, pain or tightness or restriction in the hips indicates that there's something there to work on. There's something to improve. So here are some specific tests that you can do on yourself to see if you've got hip impingement or some restriction going on in your hip. And a quick note beforehand, in the FAI Fix program, which is the program that we created to help people with hip impingement, we have over 14 self-tests to help you be very specific, very pinpoint about what you need to work on. That level of specificity is very helpful, but the four tests that I'm about to show you are a good starting point. There are also many other functional ways to assess how your hips move and feel, so don't think that these tests are the only valid ones. You also may find that sources that insist that these tests be done by a professional to truly examine whether you have hip impingement. And of course, while another person can be helpful, you're dealing with your own body. You move your body and you're capable of telling if there's something going on with it. What about if you're a gym athlete, if you're someone who's in the gym squatting, deadlifting, moving around, how can you tell if you have hip impingement during those activities? Any movement that you do in the gym can be a test. You're squatting, you're deadlifting, you're lunging, anything. But I'm gonna give you a short summary video showing you a couple kind of warning signs that you've got something off in your hip. So check it out. Hey, it's Shane. I wanna talk about some ways that you can know if you have hip impingement before pain starts to manifest in your body. And what I mean is, a lot of the times people will squat and certain things will happen. Either they'll be squatting and one foot will turn out to the side like that and the other foot stays a little bit straighter. Another possible compensation that happens when you squat is you squat and you shift away from the restricted hip and you find all your body weight kind of going onto one side. The other way is you start experiencing one-sided back pain, meaning your SI joint on one side of your body uh, starts to get lit up and get almost injured or slightly injured periodically. And again, it's just a compensation. See if any of those things are happening and if they are, start to investigate with some tissue work and some stretching where you might be missing a little range of motion in that. So how do you fix hip impingement? What are your treatment options? I spent over $25,837 trying to figure out what was the best treatment option for hip impingement. And here's what I learned. In this journey, I discovered that there are good physical therapists and there are bad physical therapists. There's good rehab centers and bad rehab centers. Of course, good exercises and bad exercises. But overall, I felt that my treatment was missing something. In fact, most PT programs or rehab programs are lacking in four key areas. Time. Usually, you only spend 15 to 20 minutes with the therapist and then 
maybe you get passed off to a junior therapist or you get put on a machine or something, but you only spend 15, 20 minutes of quality time with a therapist. Also, I found very rarely do they give you enough homework. And often it's probably because they found that their patients don't do their homework. So they say, well, just try to do these five things, but five to 10 exercises for homework is not going to cut it. Also, many physical therapists haven't themselves experienced hip impingement. They don't have FAI. So what they're giving you is from a textbook, it's something theoretical rather than experiential, like they actually lived through that. And that makes a difference. And sometimes from having reviewed lots and lots of physical therapy programs, they don't always have the best exercise selection. Sometimes the exercises they choose can actually make things worse. And again, this comes from sort of the what should work versus what actually does work in your own experience, the theoretical versus experiential aspect of this. So I wrote a much more in-depth article about this specific topic. So if you wanna dive a little bit deeper, you can watch the video that I created and read the article to learn more. So do I think that physical therapy for hip impingement is completely worthless? Of course not, absolutely not. Can a good PT help? Absolutely. In fact, I wrote an article about how to find a good PT to help complement the work that you're doing on your own body to help you overcome this problem. So I actually highly recommend finding a good physical therapist and using their support, their knowledge of anatomy and biomechanics and things like that to complement, to support all the explorations that you need to do on your own. So the summary for physical therapy and FAI is this. It can be very helpful, but you are the one that needs to become your own best therapist. That's it. So now let's talk about surgery for hip impingement. A surgeon will cut bone off your femoral head, acetabulum, or both. In the more extreme surgeries, your entire hip is replaced. You're just a Lego after all, right? This is supposed to increase range of motion and get rid of pain. The recovery process is long and surgery is quite a drastic treatment option. And the success of these surgeries is not always what you would expect. In some cases, surgery may actually make hips worse. And the scariest thing to me is I've had people as young as 18 years old emailing me saying, I'm considering getting a total hip replacement. They're 18 years old. Even with less drastic surgeries like hip arthroscopy, many people report that the surgery relieves some of their pain, but not all of it. If you just search something like failed hip surgery in all these FAI online support groups, what you'll come across might give you reason to pause before jumping too quickly into a surgical option. So if supposedly bones are the cause of pain and surgery fixes the bones, what happens when you are still in more pain after the surgery? Or what happens if, God forbid, it makes it worse? What, what gives? What's going on? What's going on is maybe the body is more complicated than just one factor like the bones determining all of your movement problems and pain. And in fact, we wrote an article about this that you can check out here to go more in depth into this topic. So do I just hate surgery and physical therapy and think that they have no place? Absolutely not. Of course, as I've already mentioned, I think that physical therapy can be a great complement to the work you're doing on your own. But I think that surgery and physical therapy are fundamentally coming from a misguided perspective, which is that it's fundamentally a bone problem and you have to fix the bone to resolve the issue. I also think it's important to counterbalance this with a muscular perspective that say that, hey, muscles and the way you move also matter big time. To read more about physical therapy versus surgery for FAI, check out this study in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2018 that compared the two approaches. As I've said several times now, I'm not arguing that PT and surgery have no place. They absolutely do. But who's the first line of defense when it comes to fixing hip impingement? Taking control of your own body and trying a few lifestyle changes and at-home exercises? Maybe even doing this with the help of a qualified physical therapist? Or a risky, invasive $8,000 plus surgery, plus the hospital expenses and extensive rehab that happen after the surgery? To me, the hierarchy is clear less expensive before more expensive, less invasive before more invasive. And of course, there are some cases where surgery is helpful. I'm just arguing that it shouldn't be the first, second, or even third option. For some people who have truly maxed out the non-surgical options, surgery can be a last resort that does make a difference. Just make sure you start with the cheaper, less expensive, less invasive options first. If you do end up getting surgery, which some people elect to do, some people want to know how to recover better, or if the surgery didn't go as well as they'd like it to, they want to know, how can I recover now? If supposedly the bone is fixed, but I still have problems, how do I recover? So I've created two videos that you can watch on this topic that'll help you answer those questions. So what about hip injections? 
Intra-articular steroid injections can be helpful to reduce inflammation and get rid of some pain. However, these effects are temporary. Many doctors and surgeons put a lot of faith that intra-articular injections help diagnose that the problem is in the joint, but this seems to also be kind of a poor assumption. The issue with all these treatments is that the patient doesn't learn any techniques to prevent or address any future hip issues as they arise. They just want and hope and pray that a pill or an injection or a one-time quick fix surgery will be their ultimate savior, but unfortunately that's not usually how life works. And in fact, we get hundreds of people emailing us every week about, oh, I got this hip injection or I got this done to my hip. And usually they report back to us after a while that eh, it didn't really resolve the whole thing. Some research is even showing that there are four potential adverse effects of joint injections. The following article discusses if hip joint injections are worth the risk. In summary, hip joint injections help some people feel a little less pain, but they're probably not worth betting all your money on. So what is the best approach to hip impingement? The best approach to hip impingement combines the best strategies from modern science with unique and innovative exercises that aren't found in most traditional rehab programs. It's also important that this approach comes from actual real life experience and not textbook theory. In this video, you can watch my own personal battle with hip impingement and how I came out of it. And in that video, you'll see that I've been where you might be right now if you're watching this video with lots of pain or possibly restrictions or movement problems. But what I want you to know is that there is hope. Out of all my own personal struggles, as well as the struggles of my partner, Matt Shu, we created something called the FAI Fix program, which is powered by what we call the TSR system. This program is based on personal experience and it's helping thousands of people all over the world who have hip impingement or hip problems. And we've been doing this since 2015, just working on this one specific topic. So we're dialoguing with many, many people about, hey, does this work for you? Does this not work for you? And based on that feedback and our personal experience, we're honing and refining how we work on this problem. So the TSR system stands for tissue work, stretching, and reactivation. In the TSR system, all three pillars are equally important. And depending on if you're a scenario one or a scenario two person, you might do more or less of one of the pillars. But first let's talk about tissue work. Tissue work is as close to a magic pill for immediate pain relief or mobility improvement that I've personally found, especially for athletes with a little bit more bulk or um, immobility, then the tissue work can be really helpful. And what is tissue work? It's basically massaging muscles in a highly specific way to restore tissue quality, reduce pain, and improve range of motion. And if you live a sedentary life or an athletic life, muscles get stiff, they get knots, they get trigger points, and you've got to do something to chew them up, to soften them up, to smooth them out. But this is much more than just foam rolling. Everyone has heard about foam rolling these days, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about deep, targeted, pinpoint tissue work that goes far beyond just basic foam rolling. And this detail is super, super critical because people will say, oh, I get massages sometimes, or I do some foam rolling, but tissue work goes miles, miles beyond just some foam rolling or just a little bit of massage. And unfortunately, a lot of physical therapy programs omit this, this part, this pillar, the tissue work, or they don't use it in the right moments for the right people. And to me, this is a huge mistake. If you simply add in a little bit of targeted tissue work, it can do great things for your hips. The next pillar in the FAI Fix system is stretching. In a sedentary or weightlifting or athletic lifestyle, muscles get tight. These muscles basically need to be stretched. Stretching is part of the TSR method because it's the main way to restore a muscle to its normal length. And as a rule of thumb, if you're not very flexible, you probably need to stretch. But which muscles do you need to stretch? The answer is, all of them in the beginning. All the muscles of the hips, the quads, hamstrings, adductors, glutes, hip flexors can tighten up and cause FAI symptoms. So in the beginning, you'll want to experiment with a lot of stretches and over time, you'll kind of narrow it down to the specific stretches that make the biggest difference for you. On the opposite end of the spectrum, there's people who actually don't need to do much stretching. Maybe they've tried stretching and it didn't work for them. If you're this type of person, then you can watch this video about what to do if stretching didn't work for you. As for everyone else, Experiment with stretching and see what it does to restore your range of motion and take away some of your pain. Here are two videos that will help you stretch better right now. Now let's talk about reactivation and re-education. Reactivation basically means waking up sleepy muscles. 
when muscles are not used, they become dumb. They have poor motor control. They don't fire very well. They can become atrophied and weak. And this is often called muscle amnesia or gluteal amnesia to refer to a commonly underactive muscle group. You can watch this video to learn how to wake up your muscles, how to activate them. Now, why do muscles become underactive or sleepy? Well, it's a combination of things. The main reason is a sedentary lifestyle. When people sit all their lives, muscles turn off and range of motion decreases. Another reason is overdoing the same movement pattern. For example, if you play soccer seven days a week, kicking with your right leg over and over again, then you might develop some muscle imbalances or certain muscles might shut off and other muscles might get too tight. Muscle reactivation or re-education basically helps to fix this in combination with the tissue work and the stretching. Another reason muscle amnesia can occur is faulty motor control, how skillfully or unskillfully you're moving your body. In short, bad motor control, moving poorly, means your, your, your body doesn't feel safe and it shuts down your range of motion. Whereas good motor control, aka moving well, means your body feels safe and it gives you more range of motion in your hips and your whole body. The muscle and movement re-education or retraining is what gives you this control, this increased skill when you move. And muscle reactivation is most commonly seen in physical therapy programs where you're doing glute exercises, glute bridges, things like that, which we also include in our own program. But it's not just about blindly doing thousands and thousands of glute bridges to try to wake up your glutes. Sometimes what you need to do is release the brakes, meaning there's a muscle that's too tight and it's like the handbrake on a car that's on. The car can't go very well. So if you have a muscle that's too tight, say your hip flexors, your glutes on the other side can't fire very well because the handbrake is on. Another part of re-education is the way that you're living your life. Aside from fixing the tissue quality, length, and strength of your muscles and working on your posture, your lifestyle also needs to be addressed to heal FAI. One of the most common kind of postural problems that people come across that contributes to their FAI is anterior pelvic tilt when your pelvis tips forward too much and that causes an early impingement of your femur with the acetabulum. When you have anterior pelvic tilt, it basically makes you look like your butt is sticking out too much. This is a problem when it comes to FAI because it causes your femurs to run into your pelvic bone too early when squatting or hip hinging or just moving in general. Now, of course, you can do stretching and tissue work to help realign the pelvis, but also training your core to position your pelvis better is a huge component of successfully coming out of FAI or hip impingement. The combination of tissue work, stretching, and re-education, strengthening, retraining your core, is what will help you get out of that anterior pelvic tilt the fastest. But even if you're doing all this mobility work, if you don't support that with lifestyle changes, you'll be taking two steps forward and then two steps back. So what do I mean by lifestyle? It's kind of a nebulous term, lifestyle. Basically it means a lot, how do you live the other 23 hours of your day when you're not working on your body, when you're not doing mobility work? That means how do you sit? How much do you sit? Um, how often do you have to drive? How do you sleep? How active are you? All of these factors need to be addressed to complement the TSR work, the mobility work that you're doing. Here are a few quick tips to help you in this lifestyle category. One is the 33 rule. If you have to sit a lot for your work, which many of us do, try to set a timer so that you work for 30 minutes and you get up and move for three minutes, the 33 rule. You can get up and just walk around, move. You can do a couple quick stretches that you know help you, but the 33 rule will help make sure that your body doesn't shrivel up and kind of restrict range of motion and cause more pain. Also, when you get home from work at the end of the day, try sitting on the floor. Just sitting on the floor or getting in the habit of not sitting in a chair all the time will force your hips to move in ways that they haven't done maybe ever or maybe in a long time. And just that simple exploration and learning how to move your muscles while you're sitting on the floor will probably do a lot to help you keep and maintain normal hip mobility. The other thing you can do is try a standing desk or try alternating between sitting, kneeling, standing as you go throughout your workday. The golden rule above all is that motion is lotion. Your best position is your next position. It's not that standing desks are better than sitting or kneeling is better than sitting or whatever. It's moving is better than not moving. So motion is lotion. These little additions combined with the, the mobility work, the rehab that you're doing in yourself will add up or aggregate to make big changes in how your hips feel. So how long does it take to recover from hip impingement? Well, you can see my detailed answer in this video over here, but the short answer is, of course, it depends. Depends on a lot of factors. 
depending on how bad your hip mobility is, your tissue quality, your overall lifestyle, what it's been like for the past 10, 20, 30 years of your life, it can take anywhere from a few months to a few years. And why such variability? Well, it's kind of like being in debt. Does everyone get out of debt at the exact same rate at the exact same time? Of course not. It depends on a huge variety of factors. There is a bright side though. Complete recovery is possible. It just may take more time for some people than others. And that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the process. You may not be where you want to be immediately, but you'll feel your hips changing and adapting as time passes. And this is an enjoyable experience. It was for me. You learn to enjoy the journey on the way to the destination. And small improvements each month keep you moving. And every few months you can look back at your improvements. And over time, the changes that you've made in your hips will probably surprise even you. But what about setting goals and crushing them? Like, I want to recover fast, some people might say. It's okay to have goals, but instead of obsessing over a hard deadline, do the best that you can and enjoy the improvements as they come. The most successful of our clients tend to learn to love the process. They tend to love learning about their hips and body and what they're discovering. They realize that they're learning invaluable life skills because if you learn the general principles of how to fix the human body when it breaks down, when something else breaks down, your shoulder, neck, pain, or something like that, you got it. You've got no problems because you've spent the time learning how to fix the human body, how to tune it up, just like a good car mechanic knows how to tune up a car. So basically becoming more relaxed about when you're going to get there actually helps you get there faster. So relax, enjoy the process. So in 2011, I was on the verge of surgery for hip impingement and I spent over $25,000 trying to fix it. And I'm grateful to say that I did fix it. And this video shows how my hips move now. My partner, Matt Shu, also suffered with severe hip pain and limitations for years. And we both chose to avoid surgery since it can't be undone. And we worked on ways to free our hips and get rid of our pain. And we took everything we learned over these years long struggle and condensed it into a do it yourself program for hip pain sufferers. You can try out the program for less than the cost of two physical therapy sessions. And if it doesn't work for you, we have a 100% money back guarantee because we want you to use the money on whatever is gonna help you with your hips. So if you're looking for a solution to help your hips, that's money back guarantee, check out the FEI Fix. Hip impingement is a big deal. I know that if you're watching this video, it might be affecting your life as it was affecting mine. So I hope that this video and the accompanying article give you hope. Hope that you can recover, hope that you can be pain-free, and hope that you can have healthy, happy hips. If you need anything, just email me. I'll be happy to help, and I'll see you in the next video. Oh,